spoiler yeah. alert for all books. And uh, so that might mean spoiler for the show. I'm going to have my little BTS cup. I oh, love that. I just, mine's just a regular mug, but I am in the process of redoing my wall, which is why I now have Michael Carrington and Stephanie Zanoni on my wall. Though I am a little bit upset that I was looking closely at all of the smaller people that have been poorly photoshopped onto this janky poster. Where are my adults? My adult characters. They're all hilarious secondary characters. You got Hollywood legend Tab Hunter in your movie. He's not on the poster. He's sure. saying reproduction. He set up the whole song. Anyway, um, let me not start on a whole thing about Grease too, because then I'll take up an hour of this however many hour session just talking <laughs> about that. But yeah, it was very important to me that they needed to be on my wall as well. So... <laughs> I love this. Well, you know, to uh, be fertile. So welcome back to my channel, Christina Strain. I'm sure anybody clicking on this knows what we are here to talk about, which is uh, the burning question that is on everyone's mind. Who are your favorites for this season of RuPaul's Drag Race? <laughs> oh, Anitra, Sasha, done. Those are my two. I love that that was your like burning question question because it's the correct question. Mm -hmm. I love them, but I also love Mistress because she is serving me season two to season six. We don't have a filter because we do not worry about Gen Z on social media. We just say what we think. And I love that. And actually, I also, we're, we're down to our top five. I like Lux and Lucy because people are so mean to Lucy and they think she's delusional. And I'm going, she's serving me TV. Yeah. Like the delusion well, is good TV. I don't care. It's the, funny. The, the friction is knows. entertainment. Well, the other thing is like, Lucy's a drag queen. What is a drag queen without a certain amount of delusion? And I'm just kind of like, when people get mad at her, I'm just like, she's a lot for a reason. That's why she's a good drag queen. <laughs> So like, I, yeah, I really do love this whole season, but like Anitra stole my heart in that first episode and she has progressively just been like the queen I want to like adopt. And then Sasha Colby has been like a legend forever. So I'm just kind of like, it's hard for me to imagine her not winning because she is everything. Like she really is your favorite drag queen's favorite drag queen. Like mm -hmm. she wasn't kidding. So, and I've seen her perform. Like I went to night uh, nightgowns twice and she's just her presence is like you've been graced <laughs> so i love her yeah but yeah but they're I think all i'll be friends. happy with any winner though because it's just i mean because i'm just already assuming that lucy's gonna get eliminated either next week or the week after that and lux i don't know maybe she could be a final because i don't know if they're doing top three or top four yeah. it's like of the three that i plucked out you could crown any of them and i go yeah cool fun love it I know my heart is mostly with my two favorites, but like, I really think that any one of these Queens is, it, it deserves a crown. I do think it's going to come down to if they do, you know, a lip sync off, it's going to come down to Sasha or Anitra. Cause it's just going to be those two. What everybody wants to see again is another rematch. So I think the smart thing is going to happen is like, even if you put all five of these queens in the finale, they're all going to like go off and like compete against each other. And unless there's some major upset, it's going to come down to those two again. Yeah. So. And then whomever is the runner up will be back for an all-star season, presumably. And we get even more of them on our television or computer screens, depending on what you, I don't own a television. I watch everything on my computer. Here's the one thing I want to know. Is this going to be the first season that Miss Congeniality is also the winner? Because I think Anitra is going to be Miss Congeniality. Ooh. Yeah, maybe. Hmm. I actually had not thought about who would win Miss Congeniality just until you brought it up. I just love that we're actually having real friction between the queens again. And not in a... I don't want anybody to get seriously hurt. I don't want any long-lasting trauma. I just want good television. Yeah. So, you know, people who are in on the joke. I don't rewatch newer seasons, but I'll rewatch the highlight reel from the older seasons <laughs> i'll just rewatch older seasons they were so good like this is part of the reason that i really liked drag race uk for the first few seasons because it felt like i was going back to like og drag race early seasons before they all understood how tv production worked and it was just like 
This is how queens actually talk to each other. Part of the reason that mistress is so refreshing is this is how queens actually talk to each other. So. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. And there's so many good quotes, like the cheek, the nerve, the goal, the audacity, and the gumption. So good. All drag race things aside, we are here to talk about Netflix's Shadow and Bone season two. So I thought that I would try to go through things somewhat sequentially, but there were certain parts that I didn't really know where to put them in. So I would pluck those out first. So I just had a couple of questions about certain alterations from the source material in mm -hmm. how they ended up playing out on screen. So for example, Bagra in the books, her rat son <laughs> yanks her eyes out off screen, but it's still a thing that happens. And in the show, she still has her eyes, but we do see him brutalize her in the sense of he cuts off one of her fingers yeah. so what was the decision behind how you came to that choice some of this is a little boring quite frankly <laughs> some of it was a production choice because I thought it might be a budget thing of like we don't want to pay for VFX every time she's on screen well the VFX is a portion of it but I think the other thing that's major because there's a version of that where you just put contacts on the actor and then the actor plays blind but for us it was just like Zoe Wanamaker is not only a legend she is a woman of a certain age. And to ask her to play blind with contacts was just like, we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. We also don't want to do that level of prosthetics on her face on a regular basis because that's several hours of sitting in a chair that you have to go through. And so there were just a bunch of discussions that we would have where it was just like, if we blind Bagra, do we do it this way? Do we do it that way? And then it was like, let's be real. Do we want to blind Bagra? Because I think there's other things we can do to her. And so like, we took her finger. <laughs> Yeah, to still translate the essence of yes. him being violent and, uh, I mean, it's elder abuse and it's- Exactly. You know. And I will say this, and I cannot speak further to this, but we have attempted to do Demon in the Wood multiple times and it has not played out. And there was a version where like the Bagra finger of it all helps explain Demon in the Wood, that short story. It kind of harkens back to that. But we unfortunately didn't get to do Demon in the Wood. There were a few things at play when we were um, breaking that story. The finger amplification thing was like helpful for us for the, you know, B side of the season. So yeah, it made more sense to go that way. And then of course, another big change. Well, maybe it's not that big as far as the logistics of the larger plot. Mal, his back tattoo. <laughs> I was ready for it. I was like, let me see. I am become a blade. And there was also a Netflix promo interview where a lot of the cast was talking all at once, but I heard Louis Tan say, he's like, oh, your back tattoo. And I was like, it's coming, it's coming. And then we just never saw the back tattoo. Obviously Mal's story ends in a different way than the books because although he does lose his powers in the books, he's resurrected, but now he's going to be the the new Sturman, the lack of the back tattoo. I'm just curious what led to that decision. Um, you know, I think that like, it was a combination of, do we have space for it? And do we need it? Like it was a fun, like it's a good thing in the book and it like harkens to a bunch, but like Mal in our show is slightly different than he is in the books. I say slightly, he's pretty different in our show than he is in the book. And like, one of the things was like, I don't want to tip the hand to what happens. So like, I am become blade is like a little bit of a big old flashing light on certain things. So yeah, it just, um, it was just a thing that we decided not to do is really what it ultimately comes down to. The Sturmhand of it all is a little bit of a different thing though. <laughs> yeah. Well, cause I, I read Eric's um, interview. I didn't memorize it, but I know that he had talked about just wanting to ensure that you can keep, your fabulous lead actors and despite wrapping up books two and three you still want to have Alina and Mal so what makes the most sense for them to continue so they and get to have brought this up because this is there's another element to this that like Eric alluded to but I think a lot of people don't understand unless they're part of production 
one of the major things that you're doing when you're considering character storylines is what your actor wants to play. Like mm -hmm. no actor, actor wants to be told you are basically a foil in a, another, another character story. They all want to know what is my character arc? Like what is my character going through? They don't want to hear like I exist solely for another character. It's not fair to do that to an actor. And then it's also not fair to do that to that character. So like a lot of the conversations that we had about Mal and where to end him up really came down to what are we going to ask Archie to play in season three? We can't keep asking him to play like the guy who supports Alina. Like he needs to have his own storyline. And in season two, you know, we gave him as much as we could where it was like him understanding where this was going. Like that's why the conversation that he and Alina have in episode five is so big where it's just like, I see where this is going and you don't see where this is going and I'm doing everything I can to support you and get you there. That This is my destiny. We can't, do that again in season three asking him to be like Alina's captain of the guard and supporting her for a third season would just be like asking Archie to do the exact same th thing and that's just no actor wants to hear that they want to hear that you have something new for them and that their character is progressively going through new experiences and it's having a different effect on them so the Sturmhand thing we came to in the room was just like we can give him his own whole thing yeah <laughs> Well, and the way I kind of looked at it as a, a person who has not officially gone to film school, but I am a very studious person about the things that I'm passionate about. And uh, I mean, taking a few classes here and there, but that's not the same thing as going to whatever Juilliard or, or, yeah. um, or, or NYU or wherever. If you look at patterns of filmmaking and trilogies, usually the second one ends in some sort of oh no the thing that I, I want the this a certain amount of closure I want this to end in a neat little bow you kind of leave it in yeah. disarray because that's what the third yeah. film usually not necessarily season but the third film will kind of now we're gonna that mess that's there at the end of season or the second film we're gonna that's the driving force of this new season so if we take the Star Wars original trilogy end of empire strikes back is han solo getting encased in yes carbonite i was just like oh no but that makes sense so you have these characters that you want to see these characters together but they're going to go their separate ways so you see inej is going to go off and make her own way mal is going to go off but then you know you know who's end game so you know that they're going to come back together as long as netflix renews it which i don't trust them to do because they cancel everything every time i open my twitter people are yelling about warrior none so you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's here's the other thing to consider is like you know we try to approach these relationships from like a real place and when I say that I mean like when you reflect upon your own relationships and everything and like relationships in general Alina and Mal go through a really traumatic event at the end of this Mal dies and then he's brought back by Merzost you know that's a big thing and on top of that like he never at any point in time had the time or energy to really reflect on what it meant for him to understand that his entire existence was to die. You know, we have this character who's in a, in a place where he's just like trying to really understand who he is now that he realizes like his whole existence was like done and he shouldn't even be here, but he's here because his girlfriend brought him back. And then on top of that, Alina, she finally got, you know, like she finally took down the darkling and the fold and like, Mal was right. She's not done trying to fix Ravka. So the two of them are not in the same place, right? Like this, and this is the reality of relationships. I've been married for almost 15 years. You either grow together or you grow apart. And I really think for these two in particular, big things happen to both of them. They have to be apart for a little bit to understand who they are and whether or not they should be back together. And that is yeah. a season three sort of exploration that we would have. Yeah. Well, and I also looked at it as, so in the books, basically all of these characters are children they've been slightly aged up for the sake yeah. of the show yes. but for the most part I kind of look at it as your young adults that are going to university for the first time you're going away from home for the first time so this is when you actually get to go outside of the bubble that you already know and kind of go exploring and then from there and those experiences you can figure out okay, this is where I want to be, or maybe I want to go back to, but you're also not going to be the same when you come back. Yeah. You experience things. 
So I thought it made sense once you get over the initial trauma of like, but I love them. I want to be together. And then <laughs> also, like, I for, like apologize to everybody out there. Look, I'm Korean. I was raised on K dramas. Like, I'm not going to make anything easy. I love writing romance so much. Like, I was one of the people in the room who was just like a, like, let's talk romance structure. You know, part of the, what makes romance is so satisfying is like when you go through it with them. So like, I'm all about putting it, you know, putting people through it with them. Like, let's go. Speaking of romance, because the show is full of it, Wesper. Oh, babies. In the books, you kind of see them gradually make their way towards becoming a couple Whereas on the show, it's like, no, we already hooked up one time. And so now we just kind of need to stop being so weird and awkward and insecure. And let's just be a couple because we clearly like each other. Structurally, it's very different. So I was just wondering, was part of that motivated by wanting them to have their own love story that wasn't too similar conceptually or structurally to the kind of we're apart and we're trying to get together that a lot of other pairings already have. Yeah, so there's a few things at play. Like, we, first of all, we have two gay men in the room. Like, we're like talking about the Just Burr and Wyland of it all. And I'm bringing up in the book that they had actually met off screen for a moment in the tannery and like, they're talking about it. And so I'm like pitching this idea that they've met and that Wyland remembers Jesper and the change we make is that Jesper didn't really remember going to Wyland to order the bomb. And the two of them misinterpreted and were like, so they boned? And I was like, I hadn't thought about that, but I mean, that's an interesting like direction. So then we all discussed it. And the thing that I think like a huge part of it came down to was like every, two things. Every single couple that Lee writes, and she'll admit this herself, is like a slow burn, which is great and satisfying when you know you have multiple books. We don't know that we have more than one season. So like the discussion we all had was like, we have all of these like delicious slow burn relationships that are kind of at varying levels. You know, Alina and Mal obviously are like not as slow burn as Kaz and Inej the ultimate slow burn. What if what we do is we vary it up a bit and we actually get Jesper and Wyland to a good place first because the other thing that is unique about Jesper and Wyland is that in the entire of the Grisha universe, they are like the happiest, most settled, reasonable couple of them all that seems to actually know how to communicate. So the thing we were interested in doing was getting to the part that we actually explore what it looks like for them to learn how to communicate with each other. If you guys have ever seen Scrubs, Turk and um, his wife, Carla. To me, I was like, Turk and Carla are my favorite couple on Scrubs because they're this like slow burn marriage couple. Like they get together and their issues are never like, we're gonna break up and like fight each other. It's more along the lines of, let's figure out where you screwed up and let's talk about it, you know? So like for us, it was like, you know, we have varying speeds of couples. Let's get them there faster and actually explore what a good solid relationship looks like and how they learn to communicate with each other. So um, cute. Like considering how fraught everybody is, it's nice to have like one really sweet couple. Cause like they can't all be fraught. Damn it. <laughs> I know. Yeah. It does get a little exhausting. If everyone is just, it's so hard for us to just admit that we love each other. I'm going, can, I also can think relax. That like, good romance does this thing where it's like, you get variation because like mm -hmm. this, of them makes you want sweetness in the other couples and when you don't get it with the other couples it hurts harder so I mean, it's just like you want to kind of like look at what you've got and like adjust accordingly so yeah there there are barometer for like sweet <laughs> yeah well and it's also kind of refreshing because if we I mean I don't want to go on a whole tangent about the haze code but there's a long-standing history of misery for queer characters and queer romance they never really get the happy ending so it is kind of refreshing that in a show where there's so many different couplings the one um well obviously there's uh nadia and um tamar but they yes that's yes. that's very early stages but out of the ones that are actually having stuff going on to a larger degree in the story it's nice that the one queer couple out of the three or four main ones is we're chilling we're happy we're good like nobody died yes. we all live at the end 
they have misunderstandings and fights, but the scale of their fights in comparison to like other couples fights are very different. And yeah. so, yeah. And again, some of it really just comes down to like, we don't know if we're going to get any more of this show. Like, I really wish that if I had a crystal ball and I knew for sure we had multiple seasons, you know, maybe we write it a different way. But the reality of every television show you work on is the only season you have for sure is the one you are currently writing. And these days, that's not even true. So like, <laughs> like considering how like AMC is canceling shows that have already been shot, like, you know, we're living in a weird time right now where we just want to make what we can make and like not take any risk of like, putting too many things on the back burner. There's a world where we never, if we didn't do Crooked Kingdom, we'd never get to it. So like, why hold off? Yeah. Small tangent, but I promise it's relevant to a, a, a thing I have to ask. So a movie that I love is Meet Joe Black. I love it so much. Thomas Newman's score makes me cry. Whenever I hear whisper of a thrill, I am an inconsolable mess. So I was rewatching that film recently because it was on whatever streaming platform. And I got to one of the scenes, I think it was just an office scene and I was watching it and I was going, oh, I can see dust. I can see dust in the air. And there was something about seeing that where I was like, oh my God, this is a real room. Something about it just made me feel so much more immersed. And I don't know why it was just getting me so, it, it's dust, which is, dust is mostly dead skin, dead humans. So I, I shouldn't be that excited that they're surrounded by dust, but it's just, cause everything is so, artificial nowadays and not for the benefit of the art form or for the benefit of the artists. I think there was a moment in, I don't know which episode, but I think it was when they're all, when Nina's getting her waffles, it might've been at that moment, but I saw some dust and I got really excited. So I was wondering how much of what you shoot is something where you get to have real tangible sets and just I, I don't know if there's been enough construct uh enough conversation about the construction of sets and practical effects and really making it a real immersive thing that the actors can touch and really explore the space instead of just being in front of a, a screen oh so much of it is real like even the stuff that involves like green screen or blue screen in our case it's like so much of it is real you know shuhan was a, was built what's wild about Shuhan, we literally explored the possibility of shooting overseas and it was just too expensive for us to do because we were in Hungary. So then it was just like, well, there's nothing here that looks Asian period. <laughs> like none of it looks like we could use it. So our production designer, like he literally built a facade over Ketterdam. So Ketterdam was built. Shuhan was a literal facade wall built over Ketterdam um, it's quite extraordinary the amount of work that they put into it, which was, again, it was like such a difficult feat for them to do for two episodes. But yeah, that's built like every location you see, aside from like the water, anything on the water obviously is like blue screen because <laughs> we're not literally on a boat on the water. But it just, to your point, it's better that way. The actors have something to act up against. Like we didn't use a volume wall or anything like that. Like none of this, you know, most of our special effect or VFX are like things like, you know, the sea whip, you know, Nichiboya. But other than that, like the sets and the locations are mostly practical. The cave was built. Like that's a soundstage thing. Like, uh, yeah, it, we just prefer practical whenever we can because the other thing is VFX gets really expensive. So yeah, it's it's like a question of like, what can you afford to do? What can you afford to fake? What can you, you know, like how far can you take it? And like in the end, a lot of the times practical is just the better option. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Yeah. So I did compile a list of, I think it's, seven times I cried in the show well not like not cry cry when I think of cry cry I think of how I saw Avatar the Way of Water 15 times at the cinema but every time they get to the tool coon hunting scene I would run out and go to the bathroom because I was like I cannot watch that again James Cameron just inflicting emotional trauma via um environmentalist themes and incidents but yeah so it wasn't violent but just 
anytime the eyes were leaking, I was like, I'm going to write this down. I don't know why, but I was just, I was taking my notes, you know, and I was messaging you the entire time I was watching it. So I was just like, I'll just tell her. I'll be like, these are the times when I cried. So um, when David has run away and he's, uh, and he's asking about Genya, I'm like, Luke Pasqualino, when I, when I see you in these streets, all the times you made me cry for decades. Luca is very lovely. <laughs> I know metal. Ugh, we will talk about that, but just, ugh, I'm just showing you the list. Jesper seeing his mother, even though it was a hallucination dream or whatever, but I was just, uh, uh, I was hoping we would see her. And then we, and then we saw her and I was like, uh, and then a lot of this is just, it's all kind of connected. So Mal telling Alina that he's the firebird. Yeah. Alina telling Nikolai that Mal is the firebird. And then Mal telling the entire squad that he's the firebird. I was just like, oh, like I can't keep this together. And then finally, of course, very predictably, David saving Genya and her screaming for him in the, what, what is it called? The, the waiter? The, the waiter, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So when I told you it was two couples that had me going <laughs> through it emotionally. I'm sorry. Yeah, it was them too, you know, where I was, ugh, Yeah. <laughs> the thing is like i knew you were gonna be like i knew the stuff we did with david this year you were gonna love so i just i spent two years not saying anything to you like i just remember being hungry like i can't tell her shit (laughs) (laughs) and and honestly i'm fine with you not telling me i was hoping that we would get to i know metal i don't need to know everything before i see it you know that scene is iconic and the sheer fact that it was in my episode was hilarious to me oh my god i could never tell her what i (laughs) yeah so those were the kind of introductory bits that I wanted to go through of just talking about a few things and then just sharing my little list of this is when she was real emotional and real messy by herself I wanted to know a bit about the decision to expedite the storytelling and combine those two books into a single season which I was fine with but again I feel like that first trilogy is very YA and that's, I'm not that demographic. So if I say that I don't care for those books, I don't want it to sound like I'm saying that they're awful books and that nobody should like them. Round hole, square peg. It's it's just that. Yeah. For me, for me. Again, it so much comes down to like, we don't know how much time we have to do this show. Yeah. You know, it's like the version where we do just Siege and Storm Look, I love Lee. I love those books. Like to me, Siege and Storm, you could get a season out of it. Sure. Is it the most fast paced season? No. Ruin and Rising is where you really want to get to because Ruin and Rising is where the payoff is, right? So like, you know, the question is, you take the risk of doing like the second book, which you get the sea whip right away. And then it's a bunch of palace intrigue, which doesn't feel necessarily fast paced or like action oriented. And I I know that there's like a whole war and there's a big massive battle at the end of it. We could do that. And then we could try to get to the end because if we do a second season of this show and only do the second book and we get canceled after the second season, we'll never finish the story. So what do we want to do? Do we want to do that? Or do we want to try to finish this story and get to as far as we can And so we opted for that option, which I have no regrets about, because quite frankly, again, you never know whether or not you're going to get more seasons. And I would rather us get through as much of Lee's material as humanly possible. And like Lee was game. She was like, let's go, let's do it. And so, and that's another thing that is hilarious to me because I don't think a lot of people know this. So when you adopt somebody's book, it's kind of every show is a little different. Sometimes the writers are involved and sometimes they're not involved. In our case, Eric is such a good kind showrunner that he never wanted Lee to feel like she didn't know what was going on. We literally pitched every episode to her. So every single episode of this, of the show pre it being written before we went off to script, we walked her through every single episode outline and like told her everything we were going to do. And if she had any objections, if you know anything about Lee Bardugo, she and I go back 10 plus years. She will fucking tell you if she doesn't like something. So she would like tell us if she didn't like something and we would discuss it with her. And then there were times where we expected her to dislike something and she'd love it. And then she'd pitch on it. So like if she didn't like something, she'd say, I don't like this. Here's why. Here's what I would suggest you do. And so she was part of the discussion the entire way through the whole season. She was completely down to clown for all of it. And it was really good and refreshing. She understood. We don't know how long we have. Let's go and let's get as much of this done as possible. Yeah. And I mean, obviously, 
I don't know what's going on behind the scenes because I don't work on the show, but speaking purely as a viewer and as a commentator of the larger film and television industries, Netflix in particular has developed a really notorious reputation for canceling things. I made the the Warrior Nun name drop, which I've not watched that show. I don't have an opinion on it. I don't mind checking it out sometime, but it's just, there's so many things to watch and I'm like, where do I begin? But they're constantly canceling stuff. That's just objectively true. So I can't even imagine when I try to even imagine what would it be like to work on that show? I'm going, I feel like working on anything for Netflix would be stressful. If it's a film, you tell the story and it's done. But a TV show where you're like kind of hoping or needing there to be multiple seasons. Oh my God, good luck. Even beyond Netflix, even beyond Netflix, if you work on a show that is a show that quote unquote sits on the bubble, you never freaking know whether or not you're going to have more than what you're doing, right? All you know is you have the season you are writing on and that's about it. And there's this like expression, like smoke them if you got them. Play every card you can. You holding out on something for a subsequent se- like a season like you know next season or two seasons down the road is really foolish in television because there's no network that you can be on where you know unless you are a massive hit like unless you are like Grey's Anatomy you don't know whether or not you have more than the season you're in it just doesn't make any sense to most of us to sit there and be like we have to save everything it's like there's certain things we know we wanted to save we know we didn't want to like we didn't want to do the ice court specifically because we wanted to finish off the Darkling before we got to Jurta Perem, because you can't have those two things at the same time. You have Jurta Perem at the same time you've got the Darkling. It's, it's Well, with the Nichevoya, it's like so which- It's a it, lot. It's like evil hats on hats on hats. It's so yeah. much. So like, it was just like in the order of operation, the escalation is Darkling, Jurta Perem. Yeah, that was the only sort of thing that we knew we had to hold off on. But like, you know, in general, it's like, get as much as you can done. Yeah. And if I mess up any pronunciation of uh, words that are specifically created for this uh, universe, uh, it's not on purpose. It's just, you know, like when you when you're used to reading something, but you're not used to saying it out loud. We see our star-crossed lovers, Mel and Alina, fleeing to, is it pronounced Zemini? Zemini? Zemini. Zemini. One of the things that I think is interesting about the show is that we do get these little glimpses of there being different languages in the show that correspond to the different locations. So do you have any insight to offer about that process of getting people to create those languages? Yes, we have a language consultant um, who we go to, David Peterson, who did the language, who did all the languages on our shows. Uh, on our show he also did um you know the language for um game of thrones basically what ends up happening is we reach out to this guy we say approximately you know make a cool language for this this is the inspiration behind it and lee knows him there's a rapport there and this is a little bit above my pay grade where i'm just like they have a conversation with him and he makes a language and he makes a written language and he sends it to us and then he sends us pronunciation guides and so then we have all of that ready on set for the actors and then we also had a a language like a dialect coach to make sure that it like sounded correct according to the guides that we were given it's like this whole other thing that is it's a lot (laughs) but it's really cool that we have like such a rich deep world that we get to explore like this yeah. The one thing that's always, I'm just like, let's not think too hard about the fact that Robkins and Kirch people can talk to each other in the same British language, but like, <laughs> let's not overthink this. Yeah. But it's also fun just seeing Nina slip in and out of, of course I know this language. Of course yeah. I know this language too. That's one of her cool things about her character is that yeah. she's fluent in multiple languages. So we, we got to play with that a lot. It was great. So that also is when we first meet Tamar and Tolia. I know that they don't pronounce it as Tamar on the show, but I read the name and I thought Tamar Braxton. So it's now Tamar. It's been burned into my brain. I can't. So it's Tamar in the audiobook. So. Okay. So Tamar Braxton <laughs> with her axes ready to go. <laughs> there we go. Obviously in the books. And this is another reason why I'm not particularly fussed about that trilogy is because we're always trapped in Alina's POV. So for these new characters like Tamar and Tolia, you get to really flesh them out and have them do things regardless of whether or not Alina is in the scene. 
So yeah. if you wanted to share any insight into just the general approach to developing and fleshing out those characters beyond how they appear in the books. Yeah. So some of that, honestly, again, comes down to the actors. Like, here's the thing when you're writing something for television. Look, when you write a novel, you can write anything. Everybody can service one character. It can all be about this one person. But when it comes to actors, you have to be respectful of their time and their existence. Actors want to make sure that when they're playing the role, that there is a story for them and that they understand what they are doing. A good writer gives each character an arc. And this show is obviously very robust in characters. We have a crap load of them. The thing that made it even harder is every one of these actors is lovely. So you don't want to shortchange any of them. Like you don't want to shortchange them because a good writer does doesn't want to shortchange them. And then secondly, you like them. So you want to give them even more. It comes down to this, like writing for television involves making sure that every character that you can has enough so that that actor feels like properly fed and properly mm -hmm. provided for, because they're going to give you better performances that way. And also you're not wasting their time. And then secondly, like each one of these characters, we just, we love all the characters. We want to make sure that they all feel like they have their own like voice and they are their own people. And I personally like, listen, I joined this show. I left a show that I loved dearly, The Magicians, to write on Shadow and Bone because the main character was half Asian. And Tolia and Tamar, Tamar, both pronunciations, are half Asian characters. And so for me, I was really excited to be able to fill those characters out a little bit. Like there's a, there's a whole conversation in episode two about what it means to have grown up in Shuhan. I like had a hand in that. And so did Nick Culbertson, who is also a mixed race person where it's just like, these are characters who are confident in their identity in a different way from Alina. But they also recognize the commonality that they have with Alina, which is like they're not fully accepted as full Shu in the same way she's not accepted as full Robkin. And they have this conversation. And it's just like that sort of thing to me is really exciting because I get to write actual personal experiences. Nick did such a great job. And again, he's mixed race, too. So he gets to come from this perspective also. Yeah, I loved it. Like writing Tolia going back to Shu Han and being like, I want to eat everything. I was like, the first thing I do when I go back to Korea is make sure I eat everything that I don't get to eat on a regular basis. Even the fucking manju from the subway station in Myeongdong. Every time I'm there, I'm going to go get my goddamn manju breads and I'm going to eat that and I'm going to like live my best Korean life. All that stuff went into that character. Mm -hmm. I also, this is just a tiny little detail, but I love that Mal, when he's running around his action scene, that he goes back to pay for the vase, <laughs> the vase, whatever. He's a good boy. I yeah. love him. Like I love him so much best boy you deserve the world and then we killed you <laughs> yeah oh i don't remember if i ever asked this but was there a reason that the majority of the leading cast is british or european whatever you want to call them because obviously the default accent that most of the characters have is just it is an umbrella term a british accent i mean some of that has to do with production because we were shooting in europe and so like British actors are closer. And so getting British day players is easier because flying them from England to Hungary is much easier to do. But then the other thing is just, there's like a lot of really good British talent and like there's a commonality in their accents. It is nice when they all sound like they're from the same place. I think it really mostly came down to production issues, honestly. Like we did see casting from multiple different countries for a lot of these characters. And what, what was interesting, truly interesting is that the Brits kept winning out. <laughs> So like, look, we had audition, like, it's not like we only auditioned British mouths. We had mouths from all over the place. It's not like we only looked at British Darkling. We looked at a ton of Nikolais from the US. What ended up happening was it was all British actors who got the roles. Mm. So I mean, it's a super small detail, but I love that Archie does not speak in a posh accent. I mean, I think he's just using his own accent, but I have this thing that I've developed over the last, I don't know how many years, where when I hear posh accents, I just, oh, I can hear the blood on the hands of your ancestors. Episode two, oh my, I don't know if, I don't think anybody else cared about this besides me, but just the trauma, the trauma of <laughs> seeing the Tulkun hunting scene in Avatar, like over and over again, running away from that. Seeing, even though I can see that this is a CGI dragon, I was still just, I don't think anybody else was as affected by it as me. I was just like, I don't want to see I was, I was like, another dead animal. I don't want to see it. I don't need to see it. I know what the story is. I knew that it was coming, but I was still just in that moment. I was going, you know what? 
this sea whip was just minding its own business, chilling and vibing in its cave, and then these dirty humans had to come and just kill it for what? For what? And you know, <laughs> we had to kill it for destiny. Yeah, I know. The other thing that's crazy about that scene is like, on Ante, our VFX supervisor. He made that sea whip look so good. Like, that is a good looking dragon, baby. Like, look at that thing. It's stunning. And so, yeah, what's funny is when that scene was shot, Shelly, like, Shelly was on set that day and she was sending me photos. And, like, one of our, like, stunt dudes was in a green uniform so the sea whip was actually played by a dude in a green suit and he was just running around and everybody had to be terrified by him and it was so funny to look at the photos because he's just like running around like this and it's you just need like that in a blooper reel I, I i bet i bet it'll come out at some point like netflix will drop the footage at some point i'll just be like that's it that's the thing but like it was hilarious like she's just sending me clips and i'm just like dying because i'm like <laughs> how are you guys not cackling like this is so funny and then another question that I had that I know other people who have read the books had was why did we not have uh more I guess more pieces to Nikolai being disguised as Sturmund like, uh, what was the reasoning for that that is a combination of the amount of time it takes to put like stuff on people's faces mm. and then like the vfx cost of like doing like it was just a it was like we all sat down you know and it's like do you put a fake nose on him that's kind of offensive do you put a fake chin on him? like what are we gonna do like and then what's he gonna do like vfx magically like let, let it go also we have this thing where in the books you know when you get tailored it naturally kind of starts to wear off that is a progression nightmare. Like keeping track of that sort of a thing is a continuity like issue all the time. And then if you mess it up, you have to fit, fix it in VFX. So like for us, it was just like, this is a really cool book detail, but in terms of production, it is a little bit of a nightmare. So we were also just like, why not just look at Patty's handsome face? Like he can just act. And I think that like the thing that's glorious about Patty is he does such a really good job of being like Sturmhand and then being Nikolai. And they're two different characters, but they're, they feel of the same person, you know? He did it all with his acting. We were like in a good place there. This might be a controversial opinion to have, but I'm going to say it. So I think we got to, I want to say it was episode three. I don't know at what point in the runtime. And I was going where is Vasily? I want to see Vasily. And I know a lot of you are being like, I hate that guy. Why would you want to see him? And I'm going, because I want to see him suffer. Okay. <laughs> I want to see this man destroyed. I want people to insult him. I want people to make fun of him. I want everything to be at his expense. I am praying for his downfall, you know? We so when he finally showed up, I was like, oh, finally, my God. And then, you know, just seeing him just I was like, I'm no fan of the Nietzsche Voya, but maybe they had some points, or at least one time they had some points. I gotta say, when he gets when he gets like the the pull, I when I saw the final version, I was like, Ante, beautiful work. <laughs> like, it looks great. <laughs> like, so good. <laughs> yeah, because I read it, I remember like, writing it in my so notes. Cool. I was like, where is Vasily? Re reading those books, I was like, oh, oh, I can't, oh, I I hate this man. I was like, oh, and then. It was like, oh yeah, his arm gets ripped off. And I remember I, I did an edit in one of my videos that I, I didn't get to make as many videos in the lead to the show. I just didn't have time. But there was a point where I, I did kind of an edit where I like to do cutaway gags to use memes or I make my own memes of stuff that I like. So I took that part from the Adams family where they're seeing the kids do their play. Wednesday cuts off Pug Pugsley's arm and you just like the parents, the family is looking on in glee. And I was like, I was like, oh, that's us. And that's like Vasily and that's karma. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, no, we uh, we knew what you wanted and we did it. <laughs> I loved it. I really did. One last thing, because there's so much more detail I could go into, but we still have so much else to cover. Finally, when David came back, the hand acting, the hand acting. That's genius 
decision making as an act there's the line from the books where he's like i don't make things i do or i don't destroy things i make things or it's the other way around whatever that was the one quote i was like oh it would have been nice if they gotten in there but it was still my second favorite behind i know metal so i was like as long as i got i know metal i'm fine but the hand acting oh my god i could not believe what i was seeing i was just like that makes so much sense that's such a smart choice that's everything i mean obviously that's not really a question for you because you don't really make that decision i don't think no. you're directing actors but I don't know. Like, did you did you get to see any of that happening in real oh, yeah. time? Or like, oh, yeah, he was uh, heavily featured in five. So yeah, I did get to see. Except, except Luca, you know, did a much more controlled version of David for my episode. But yeah, he. I really love what he does with that character. It's part of what we adore about him, and part of the reason that it's just like, well, of course we want to bring him back for season two. If we can get him, we're gonna definitely put him in season two. So like, yeah, season three, <laughs> dude. If we can get him, like he's. I mean, Luke Pascalino is famous, y'all. Yeah, he's fa he's like blessed. again. I don't remember if we talked about this while I was recording. I mean, we're kind of jumping around a little bit. I didn't know that David dies in the books. So once I found that out, I was like, oh, okay. Well, then, because at first, you know, because I was messaging you as soon as that reveal. We don't need to overly talk about it because we're going to get into it sequentially. But I wrote you. I was like, Christina! I was like, where is David? <laughs> but yeah. I didn't know yeah. that he died in the books. If I had known that from the beginning, I would have been like, oh, they're just condensing the timeline. But you know what it is? Luke Pasqualino has, he has this thing of, mm -hmm, I'm going to show up. I'm going to be real cute. I'm going to make you fall in love with me. And then I'm going to die. He does that over and over and over again throughout his career. You know. Did it in Skins. He did it in Snowpiercer. Listen, so I was like, why would it be any I, different for Shadow and Bone? This is his gig. This is what he does. I fell in love with him in Skins. And I feel like Freddy's death was the worst death I've ever seen on television because I feel robbed. But, but I just want to say, we genuinely have no idea flat out what happened to David yet. Because like, it's a question, like, it's just, again, like. It's just actor availability. We love him and he loves us. But like, if the guy like goes and he books a huge show, like, of course he should take the show. Yeah. So like, we, we're not sure on that one, you know, fingers crossed that we can get him back, but there's like, we'll see. Fingers crossed we get another season. Let's yeah. see what happens. Oh my God. Just the tra trauma. Um, <laughs> yeah. I did have some trauma. Stuff. I'm like, yeah. trauma? Yeah. <laughs> There's more that I could say about episodes one through four. It was just stuff to do with Bagra, but I can save that for episodes five to eight. So getting into Kaz versus Pekka, I will just share my POV first before we get into you talking about the decision on the creative side of things of why this part got put into the show in the way that it did. But so I reread Siege and Storm, Ruin and Rising, Six of Crows and Crooked Kingdom. It was really getting down to the wire. I was rereading them before this season came out. And for anybody who might be watching this who has not read those books, the kind of, ooh, we, we, we got Pekka, this revenge thing. Of, we're going to pretend that we, we got his son and then, and then we didn't actually do anything because we're not as evil as they think we are. That's like a really short bit at the end of Crooked Kingdom, which is the second book in that duology. The first book is mostly the Ice Court heist. And then majority of the second book is a battle against Van Eck. So when I was reading it, I was going, I just feel like if you were to do this very literally copy and paste into television, anybody who tunes in who has not read the books is going to go, if this is such a big deal, this revenge plot that he's been building mm -hmm. towards, why are you just kind of shoving it in at the end, just kind of after this other big bad villain of this season, presumably, if you would even get to reach that point of uh, doing the Van Eck storyline. Oh, and Van Eck is uh, Wyland's father. I thought it made sense to put it in now. And also then anybody who hasn't read the books now understands why Kaz doesn't want to touch this girl that he's madly in love with, even though he loves, but he's like, ugh, ugh, like you're hot and I love you, but like, because otherwise they don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so but I'm gonna be perfectly frank. I actually don't like read a lot of fan. Like I don't go looking for what fans think of things. But people bring me stuff on Twitter, and I do see that some people are real big mad that we did Crooked Kingdom before we did. But it's not even the whole story. It's like this much. 
much of it. It's just, well, the bigger thing, so it comes down to a few things. Cause like, I think, I feel like I've said this like a thousand times, but it really is like, you know, we don't know how many seasons we have, so we're not going to save stuff. But the bigger thing was like, what are we going to do with the crows before we get them back on Alina's storyline, right? How many times can we tell stories with Pekka that aren't Crooked Kingdom? The thing we knew we needed to do is we needed to get into Kaz's backstory so that people understood what was going on with Kaz. So we need, oh my God, you can't see. <laughs> she was, you know, coming at me. So I had to give her some attention, but yes, carry on. <laughs> So like the thing we knew we needed to do is we need to get into Kaz's backstory because we didn't do it in season one. And what are we going to do? Like hold off on it for one more season? Like that doesn't make any sense. So like if we're going to do Kaz's backstory, why not do the Pekka stuff in Crooked Kingdom? Because the reality is, aside from being in the flashbacks, Pekka's really not in Six of Crows. Kaz lets him out of prison for a second and then he's in the epilogue. So it's like we have Dean let's utilize Dean and tell this fucking awesome story from Crooked Kingdom because even if we do get to do Six of Crows which we'll touch on later but like we won't be doing Pekka again like because we'll have told the Kaz flashback story so like smoke movie got him use all your cards right so yeah. we did that here because it was just like it was the natural progression of things you met Kaz Brecker in season one. Season two, you understand his damage, his psychological damage. We had already set up Pekka in season one. We should just go ahead and play Pekka in season two. Because otherwise what we're doing is doing a different story with Pekka that isn't Crooked Kingdom and just putting off telling the meat of what everybody really wants, which is the, the real central conflict between Kaz and Pekka. So we like did a little bit of a remix and shuffled the way that we told those stories. And, and again, like, you know, what are the odds that we get to Crooked Kingdom? Yeah. I don't want to like put it off and never tell it. Yeah. And also in order to have the amount of views that would make the show considered a success, you can't just get the book fans. You have to get a bunch of people who have never read these books, probably never going to read these books. And they do not know that Kaz has a touch aversion like yes. there's little easter egg nods in season one of oh let's do a really cinematic close-up to his gloved hands let's have Freddie play this moment of yes. oh I want to go help her she's injured but I can't go over oh the and and I don't think we were talking about this uh before we started recording I don't think people who don't already know Kaz's backstory would know I don't think they would even see that that's what Freddie is doing. I think they're looking at Inej because she's the one that's injured and she's the yes. main character of that moment if you don't yes. know to look at Kaz. So. And let's also get into into Jesper for a split second because like season one, we spent so much time subtly nodding to the audience who knows that he's a Grisha and we never really verbally acknowledged it. So in season two, you know, the discussion that you have is like, do we keep doing that? How many seasons do we put off revealing that he is Grisha? Like, why would we keep doing that? So, like, you know, between the Wyland dyslexia storyline and then, like, that it was like, well, we have two characters with two secrets. Why don't we just reveal them? It makes more yeah. sense to just do that this season than to keep putting it off for as many seasons as possible. Because, like, imagine a world where we don't get another season and then the audience who has never read the books never knows. I'm yeah. just like, that is, like, to me that would have been a failing on our part. Yeah, and also I like the fact that you've been able to infuse original storytelling that isn't identical to the books because I'm just gonna use one example from the Kaz versus Pekka storyline. Um, the moment where he is really laying into Pekka and saying like, I found your son, I know, I know your son's name, I buried him, blah, blah, blah. If you've read the books, you know that he did not touch a hair on this child's head. Yeah. So any dramatic tension in that scene of, ooh, I don't, I don't know, like, is Kaz, would he go that far? If you've read the books, I didn't feel any fear or kind of existential, mor moral, like, there was no real question or dilemma because I'm just going... Yeah. Okay, no, but they're going to reveal that the kid's fine because we already know this. And I would be curious to know from anybody who watched that scene that hadn't read the books, if they, what were they thinking or feeling and, and how did they experience that scene? And 
you know, I think it would be more interesting to, I like the Crows stories in the books, but also if you kind of already know what's coming, then it, that's just one example of, well, I mean, I know the kid's fine. Yes. So, yeah. And then on top of that, I think another thing that people need to remember is that like, the sheer nature of bringing these characters into this world requires us to make some changes because if we don't have these characters progress or make adjustments to the storylines or like give them actual arcs, they are not going to change and they're going to just live in like crystallized glass and there's, there's really nothing for us to do with them. So we have to make adjustments to the story in order to advance their character. Like with Kaz, like, we did want him to be a little harsher in this season than he was last season. We want to show him get like, go to a darker place in order to do that. You have to make some changes along the way. Like you have to take what's there. Like we wanted to honor what was there and make like slight adjustments, recognizing that we did something different last season and amp it up a little bit. Yeah. I also really liked the addition of Nina to yeah. the group. Five. Like I know they, they made this joke. I'm kind of going out of order, but, um, five of crows and I was going but that's all you need really but um maybe I shouldn't (laughs) kick that hornet's nest today but um I don't believe in redeeming puritans or any allegorical version of puritans because they're genocidal maniacs and like if you don't know that then like I don't know maybe talk to some indigenous people and learn their history she's just such a she brings such a different energy to the group and of course it's also nice having Wyland there but uh she has a certain amount of the way that she speaks and the way that she responds to what she sees from the other characters that she really makes herself known in a way that is really entertaining. You know, like that moment where um, I wrote it down somewhere in my notes where I think it's Jesper who says, oh, I like having her around. I was going, I do too. This is so much fun because you all are so miserable so much of the time. We needed this. We needed this. The thing I love about Nina is this, like I, I've, I've had this conversation with a few people, but it's like, and the actors in particular, where it's like some of my favorite scenes to write involve Nina and Jesper, because out of all of them, the two people who are willing to bring shit to the forefront and actually call out crap are them. Every other crow is just like, I don't want to talk. But those two are just like, about what? <laughs> Let's talk. <laughs> So like to me, they're the best kind of shit stirrers where they just they create conflict by nature of calling out the conflict. And I <laughs> and they're, you know, Kit and Danny are so good. They're so easy to work with and they're just so charming and they just bring so much light to each scene they're in. I'm like, ugh. everybody on this show is so lovely. Yeah. Well, and I just love that um, you know, we also got to see some moves being made for Kaz and Inej because they're both such wounded little birds and to finally see just a slight cracking of the shell the shell's still there but you just kind of crack it a little bit and I'm just oh oh not you going over there to tend her wounds doing nothing but you made an attempt and I appreciate that listen a slow burn still gotta burn you know like it's still gotta make like incremental progress and it's just like ah god I fucking love writing romance (laughs) Yeah, but also that's what I'm saying is for anybody who's feeling like, oh, it's too soon to explain Kaz's touch aversion. But that scene will not have that weight if you don't understand that the single most traumatic thing that has ever happened to this guy means that he doesn't want to touch people, but he wants to touch her, but he can't, but he wants to, but he can't. Yes. And (laughs) keep that circle going over and over again. Also, like, they're... Look... Again, like you can't really keep them frozen in ice and not making any sort of creeping forward momentum with them. Like there needs to be some sort of advancement in their romantic plot line. Otherwise, you're just like, what's the fucking point? And so I really like of the couples, they are one of the most fun for me personally, because I really love slow burns. (laughs) And like, I just love slow burns. Because, like, it goes to my K-drama core, where it's just, like, how long can I torture someone with, like, no touch? I got two speeds. It's either no touch, or they bone and then have feelings. It's one or the other. (laughs) (laughs) And also, I just think that 
Kaz is such a unique character because there are not a lot of um, disabled main characters who are as capable and you know he's such an interesting character for everything else and then you just add oh and he also has a cane and so you know just seeing him beat the brakes off of an entire squad of goons he's like i know you see the cane but also you're all gonna be on the floor by the time this is finished you know and that was fun to watch because once that got going i was going oh yeah i did i remember reading this in the books where he's just it's like so he good. takes damage which i also appreciate because you know i'm not gonna name names you can look it up but like i'm not gonna name names but there are certain action stars that have developed a reputation for they don't want to take damage when they're doing action they don't want to look like oh they got hit they got injured and i'm not even talking about real injuries i'm talking about their characters and i'm going well then the stakes don't feel real but with him it's like oh no oh oh is he is he okay but then he is but but he's not but he is you know yeah no you want to see kaz take it take it hard and keep going because that's who he is he is like a character who takes damage and keeps going. That is like literally the core of who he is. I love that scene. It was one of my favorite scenes in Crooked Kingdom. So I was really happy we were able to do it on the show because I feel like you don't realize just how tough Kaz is and how desperate he is for revenge until that moment. Because like you see this dude who you think is like, mostly good at being the smart one, get fucking down with that goddamn cane and he yeah. just takes them all and you're like, I underestimated you, sir. Like, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll grovel now. Like, yeah, but it was it was really very satisfying. Because even though I already said that that whole thing with Albi, where I'm going, okay, but you can monologue as much as you I know you didn't hurt the child. I mean, I kind of wish I didn't know because then I could go, ooh, I don't know, did he? I, I don't know. But, <laughs> but I know I read the book, so I know you didn't. But even though that fight is basically the same as what's in the book, like yeah. he does have a huge thing where he beats up a bunch yeah. of guys. I still, in the moment, in the heat of the moment, I was going, well, I don't know. Like, well, because I know, you know, they sometimes change things. So maybe he's not going to be okay. But then, but he was good. I was like, oh, okay. That's my guy. He's fine. You know, he's not fine, but he's fine. You know, his version of fine. I love him. I love yeah. Him. Oh, and I appreciated Jesper said that he likes Wyland's face. I believe that is a book quote, <laughs> book reference. You know, I like that even though their story is very different from the canonical progression of how it yeah. develops in the books, I like that you were still able to throw in those little nods, which is, which is cute. I just love them so much. I love them so much. And uh, yeah, we'll talk more about them later. I have so many things to say about my episode. <laughs> when they're talking about weapons and Kaz says suffering as the weapon, I laugh because it's like, you're so dramatic. I believe the stakes. I believe you. I believe what you're saying. You say what you say with conviction, but I'm still just, sometimes he's just so ridiculous. I'm like, you are such a drama queen sometimes. <laughs> but I love it. I love it. It's fabulous. It makes for great television. And Freddy, you know, he, just, he gets that look on his face that he has for the majority of the time he's playing Kaz. I'm going, yeah, no, no, that was fun. It's a good time. I appreciate it. <laughs> it's true. He's so good. Another reference that I wanted to mention before I cut this into the into the next one is um yes. the part where he has his confrontation with Pekka and he's forcing him to submit. And it's just this show of dominance. I'm going to humiliate you in front of your crew, blah, blah, blah. When he makes him kneel, do you know what the first thing that popped in my head is? Can what? you guess? Home Alone 2. Where he's, because when he fakes out the hotel staff and they come into the room and he puts on the movie and the guy on the screen is like, get down on your knees and tell me you love me. Get down on your knees and tell me you love me. Tim Curry and all the other people, they kneel down. On your knees. And he's like, I love you. <laughs> I just never, never would have gone to Home Alone too. That was the I love you. That was the first oh, no, thing that popped into my head. Do you I mean, know where I, I went? I never would have guessed Home Alone 2. Sometimes when I watch stuff and I process things and I think about, okay, if I were to talk about this in a video, what's the cutaway gag that I would do? And yeah. then you kind of add text to it. So I was like, oh, I would show that clip from Home Alone 2. That's Kaz. That's Pekka. And Kevin giggling into the remote is me watching it. 
I love you. Okay, everyone. So that's going to close off episodes one through four. Stay tuned for part two in which we will be going through episodes five through eight and maybe some talk of other p- things the sp- spin-offs that are are not are not are not hap- are not are are not happening uh i don't know i don't work for netflix uh, <laughs> <laughs> i shouldn't laugh because i can't stand how they handle things you know ever since sense eight i've just been traumatized when it comes to them it's a toxic relationship i stick with them because now they got me invested in bridgerton so it's a whole thing but Yes, everyone, come back for part two. We'll be back.